One of the first things I'd like to do is uh, thank all our sponsors that helped us put together and provide input and money uh, for today's event. And I'm going to just read through the list. Um, South Dakota Wheat Commission, Farm Credit Services of America, Wheat Growers, Mustang Seed, Monsanto, Prairie State Seeds, Next Level Ag LLC, Millborn Seeds, Lacrosse Seeds, Dakota Best Seed, Agronomy Plus, Farmers Alliance, Mitchell, First Dakota National Bank, c and Operations in Davidson County Implement, Scott Supply, Crop Tech, Ducks Unlimited, Aurora County Conservation District, Davidson County Conservation District, Hanson County Conservation District, uh, South Dakota No-Till Association, SDSU Extension, USDA and NRCS, and Pioneer Hybrids of DuPont. So let's give them all a welcome round of applause. Um, I'm going to remind you for Josh that those of you who took these and they need those by the end of the day. I took your money, but we need a thing to go with them. So, um, like Dan said, I'm Kay Schmidt. For those of you who don't know me, I grew up uh, just north of here, or just east of here, um, where South Whitlock Resort is. My sister Pat runs that now on our family ranch. Um, my mom and dad, uh, mom was Doc Nold's secretary for years in town at the vet, and my dad was a spray pilot. And I married into the uh, Schmidt family in Gettysburg. They ran the standard station there by the Catholic Church for years, and, and my husband delivered bulk fuel, and now he delivers, helps deliver feed. He runs the driveway at the mm -hmm. CHS, what used to be CC Bar, <laughs> feed in town. So i uh, been here a long time, and I know some of you and don't know some of you. So um, when Danny asked me to talk, he said specifically about nap and covers because we were dealing with some Australian peas and some full season cover crops. Um, but I also said we do have some livestock programs available through the office that not everybody's aware of too. So I'm going to hit the highlights. I've got handouts that cover everything in detail, and I did give you handouts in case technology is always spotty at best. So I'm going to talk. I'm not going to read you these slides, but I'll talk fast. So first up is NAP, which is our non-insurance crop disaster. It works pretty much just like federal crop insurance does. Uh, basically, you get what you pay for. Cat coverage at 50% of the approved yield and 55% of the price is $250 per crop. Um, you can, for 250 you can cover all of your pasture. Not very much, but it, if you pay it once, it's probably going to cover your $250 premium for the next 10 years. Um, currently, we have 17 crops with 39 different types or intended uses. We are in the process of adding the cover crops with vegetables for this year. Um, we added Australian peas last year. Um, all it takes is if there is something that your crop insurance doesn't feel comfortable carrying, come talk to us. We'll see what we can get get added in. Um, so biop is available if it's not for grazing and that works exactly like crop insurance as well. 100% of the price and you can buy up to from 50 to 65% of uh, the yield. Uh, we don't have anyone yet that's used the biop feature because most of our policies are currently just grass but we're willing to work with you on that. Um, if you are a beginning farmer, limited, pre limited resource producer, or a be, uh, socially disadvantaged person, the first $250 is waived altogether, and your buy-up is 50% cost. Um, there is a tool that lets you self-certify whether or not you're a limited resource and rancher. Beginning farmer is usually anyone who has farmed less than 10 years. Um, and you do have to certify that every year. Uh, gender or race, socially disadvantaged, obviously, once you're a woman, you're always a woman. You fill that out once. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore. Anything can happen. Anything can happen, yes. <clears throat> so, whoops. Um, the causes of loss on NAP, pretty much anything you can think of. Uh, most of ours have been paid, uh, paid on drought. We did pay, um, you can insure your um, sorghum or your millet hay. And we have had paid some uh, due to untimely rains during the planting season for that. We have paid PP as well. Um, 
Insect or disease can be on its own, but if heat causes the anthrax or the wet weather, the heat causes something else, um, then it is a, a, an affected fat. So in 2016, Potter County paid $13,446 on forage losses under our NAP policies. Um, right now we're waiting, the state committee has to concur on our grazing losses and we do have some of those, so. Okay, then if you have a, if you have a loss from your, on your forage, then we just contact you and then you get the adjuster out of that just like crop insurance? Just like crop insurance. If you're going to hay it and you, you know, your APH is two ton an acre, you come in and say, I bailed everything I had, I got six quarters of, you know, three quarters of a ton. If you are not going to hay anything, then yes, we do need to adjust it. And we do have loss adjusters, and actually they're usually the same people. Um, Dwight Husted, he, do, he adjusts crop insurance. He does now. So they're located throughout the state. Um, eligible producers, basically anybody that has a share or a risk in the crop, and here's the important part, you have a 578 on file. You have to report your grasses to us. That's, a, that's kind of new for some of my just ranchers. Um, and we report that in the fall. Uh, November 15th was the deadline, but we can take a late filed anytime you come in. So, um, let's see. The coverage period, basically, when you start, when you, 30 days after you pay your NAP fee till the end, other than grazing, of course, that's our normal grazing season in Potter County, May 1st through October 31st. The basic things to remember to stay eligible for NAP. We use your yields just like crop insurance. You need to next, be the next one. There you go. Um, so if you don't report your production to us, you get a zero for that year. A zero yield takes a long time in a 10-year APH to get rid of. So if you're not going to hay it, you're not going to harvest it, let us know. We'll appraise it. Um, if you file a loss in Potter County that's, or in the county happens to be a disaster yield or year, uh, in de declared disaster, we are uh, authorized to use 65% um, of T. Right now, most of our hay is at 1.97 ton per acre for a T yield. So you won't have to take a complete zero even if, it is a, if it's a disaster year and you have a low yield, but not enough for a loss. So that helps too. But do report your production to us, and it is required. Um, when you file a notice of loss, it's when you first notice it. Obviously for PP, it would be the 15 days after the final plant date. Uh, for grazing, little hit and miss. You know, does it look like, well, in June of this year, our grass kind of looked like it wasn't going to make it. And we had a lot of people file. And then it was like, well, we got that rain. Well, I think I'm going to be okay. So it's better to file the loss and not need it than not to have it. And if you file a loss, your um, loss adjuster, you have no cost to you whatsoever. So that helps too. Um, how we pay a grazing loss, if you have a forage policy, we use your exact production. You have a 25% loss on your hay, you're going to get a 25% loss on your pasture. You have a 68% loss, you'll get the same. If you don't hay anything or you don't have a forage policy, if we can find a couple farms around you that have hay policies, we're allowed to use those as well. If not, then it gets a little tricky. I go to NRCS. Juanita was out, where's she at? Was out earlier um, this spring and did a couple assessments for us. And Kelly, I know you've done them in the past for us as well. well that's what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. like Dwight Houston, if he's done a couple adjustments, why not use that document? And we can, but one of them has to be an NRCS grazing specialist. Oh. That's how our state committee set it up. Yep. Yep. So is it, is it uh, And actually, we've never had them be that far off before. I mean, our loss adjuster was pretty close to what Juanita and Isaac okay. came up with too. And honestly, the hay production kind of supported that. Okay. It, I've never had them where they're way off, okay. at least in Potter County. No. Right. Yep, and I know Falk County, NRCS has grazing cages set up, and Eric, help me out, they've been there for, what, 10, 15 years? Wow. Yep, and Eric, when he was our acting DC, was kind of, when we get a DC in Potter County, we're going to hopefully try to get some of those set up, too, so then you'll have a good county-wide. That's 
Christ. Well, I've always encouraged that since I've been, been here, especially for the producers, you can do it yourself. If you have your old records, you know what your production, all your passions are, year in and year out. So when you do have a bad year, you have something to compare it to. Because other than that, we get these averages, and you know, a lot of times the rain is sporadic within the county. Got the biggest thing that, 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 that allowed grass to grow was how it was managed the year before, before it was even the drought. So management <coughs> had a huge impact on, on the amount of vegetation growing in there, and it has to be a drought, and, and so there's a lot of things. So if you had a cage out there, you got the solid proof of this is the way I manage my ground. It's like this, it's the production I'm getting out of, out of the year to year. Makes a it does, it really does. And, and like Kelly said, especially in Potter County, you know, what we get at the river is nowhere near what we get at Tolstoy. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes the river will get way more. Also, river breaks, you guys run probably 12 to 14 acres on an AUM. Eastern part of the county, I've seen them down to four. So it, it does make a huge difference, but we're working on it. And, and like I said, we hope to get um, the next couple of pages are just the crops that we actually carry, currently carry right now in Potter County. Um, the state office did send out a memo on RMA has a whole farm revenue protection that's going to be piloted in South Dakota this year. And you can use NAP and that but when it came down to if there was a payment, you would have to choose between one or the other, but you can carry both policies because it's a pilot right now. So that's something new for 17. Um, I did in your handout, this is, if you have any questions about NAP or what you think NAP will cost you, come see your FSA office. We can run spreadsheets like this on any kind of crop you want. This, I just used 80 acres of TEF. Basically, in addition to the $250, I can get cat for $313 an acre. I can buy up the max for $988. Now, since I'm a woman, it would cost me half of that, <laughs> but for the most part. And this is supposed to be available to the public, but Danny and I, we could not get that to work yet. No, so it was on, it, it'll work on Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer, okay. It won't work on Chrome. Chrome, okay, okay. And, and there is a website in here on how to get it, but if you have trouble, come into the FSA office. Any of us can run it. It takes two seconds. What We ran three scenarios in five minutes probably, Dan. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't take yeah. long. Yeah. So like I said, come see us. We're good. We'll be fine. Teresa likes nap. Just ask her. <laughs> oh. All right. Next one. Don't knock the weather. You didn't have weather. You couldn't, couldn't start a conversation. Um, that's pretty much NAP in a nutshell, and it was fast and furious. Any questions on? Like I said, it works a lot like crop insurance. You know, okay, one thing on our pastures, and he mentioned a guy should have a, like a 16 foot square where you, you don't want to graze in. Oh, it only has to be four foot square, I think they decided. But should a guy do a, a biomass of that, or how do you? They just do, pictures, or what do you do? Clippings, as far as I know, they just use clippings the clippings. And then send them in. Well, you, we can weigh them. We can work with you. If anybody's interested in doing that, we'd be more than happy to come out. And it, it takes you longer to drive to that spot than a little to. All we're doing is just put the whole bio, uh, clipping, okay. drive, weigh it, and be done with it. But the key is every year, the fall, you gotta move, you need to really move it, yeah, and mow off the spot in the, in the bounds of the ground so you have current year's growth, yep, coming the next year. And it's just about to say October 1st every year, you just make a habit of moving that, yep. And they did say, um, I know I talked to different people from NRCS, and it kind of depends. Some people just use the stockade panels, but if you've got rats, they said rabbits will really play, they like to get in that nice green grass that nobody grazes, so some of them will use the hog panels where it's smaller on the bottom, so. There's all kinds of, we're not doing this for a scientific research project. Yep. We're just doing it for a rough, good estimate of how much production we're receiving off the range. Yep, and I did talk to the new FFA, the <coughs> ag teacher, and he said, you know, if we had some specs, he would not be opposed to just having the kids build some if anybody wanted to use them. Buy the supplies, he'll look them up. So, so yeah. I think it'd be a good to know just to know what you're producing. And it is. I and mean, just for the 
grazing benefit? I mean, how much you're taking off? Yep, and and the counties around us, NRCS does it quite a bit. We just haven't had it, so but we'll get it started, and hopefully we'll we'll get there. Got it. Good deal. How you take one cattle panel and you can cut it just right and make some four-sided thing, and then he puts his rain gauge on it. Oh, okay. He, he has a rain gauge, and he said if you put in 18 cc's of automatic transmission fluid. Now I don't know why it has to be automatic transmission fluid, and then you can leave it out there all year. The water, of course, goes through the oil. The oil flows on top, so you can read it once a year, and you know what you got all year because it's only evaporated. That's a good number. And I know some. I know Monty puts his on wheels, uh, lawnmower wheels, he just wheels it around the next place. So I think you'd have to stake them down so the cattle didn't rub them. But I don't know. <laughs> That's why we have the NRCS offices. <laughs> Um, next up would be, uh, this is a pasture uh, program we have as well, Livestock Forage Disaster Program. We paid this in Potter County in 2012 and 13. It has to be extremely dry before this will kick in. Um, you can have NAP and this, um, but you'll, again, you'll have to choose between the payments, and let me tell you, there's not a big choice. You will take the LFP payments in a heartbeat. Um, but like I said, it takes you to be a qualifying drought, and I've listed on the next pages the five stages. Um, D0 and D1 do not count. Um, and in, as dry as it was this year, we were never over a D1 in Potter County. The nice thing about this program is if one part of the county is it, the entire county gets the program. It does not have to be the whole county for this. So like I said, we paid it in 12 and 13, and, and we haven't paid it since. So. Eligible livestock, pretty much everything you can have. You can't count the deer though, unless they're tame and is part of your commercial product. Um, as far as recreational livestock, that would be up to each individual committee. I can tell you right now my Potter County committee feels that if you've got horses, you're using them because why else would you be feeding them? So we've paid, <laughs> I know they're hay burners. I've never rolled one down a hill though. So <laughs> Um, but that is an individual county committee call as far as what would be recreational. Uh, you know, I, I was going to give Corey a bad time because I know Corey and Casey rope, but I also know they use their horses for everything else too. So uh, there again, you can't use the wild free roaming deer to count, but we've paid on pretty much everything else. Um, you do have to own or lease them 60 days before the drought period starts. Um, if you run them on an animal unit basis, uh, the, there is a form because you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have certified that grass to us at the office, but there is a form that the person who does have the grass would sign and say, yes, they run these on an animal unit basis, they're responsible for fences, watering, however the agreement is, and then that will, that will help you out. Again, file the grazing report. Um, these are the payments for six, what 16 would have been if they paid, 17 has not been Next page. Anyway, 17 haven't been released. <coughs> the, the thing to remember about this program is if you had to sell down because of the drought, you, we will pay you for two more years on the animals that you would have kept had you had the grass, which is a nice project because management is a, a huge deal. I didn't keep 700 head. I could only feed 500. Well, that's, that's a good thing. So we're not going to penalize you for being a good management manager so that helps too. Um, that one, having grown up with a dad who didn't believe in even come-alongs, I liked this one. <laughs> I always thought that's why my dad had children to open gates and throw hay bales. So. And pick, no we didn't have to pick rocks, we had cows, we didn't, they didn't care. <laughs> Um, LIP, Livestock Indemnity Program. This one a lot of people don't seem to know about, but it's a very good program. It pays on excess of normal mortality rates for weather-related livestock deaths. And you talk about rain on Christmas Eve, let me tell you, there were weather-related livestock deaths in a hurry. Um, we have some still in January. That snow come on top of the ice. Now they fall down, they break a leg, they can't get up. That's weather-related. South Dakota, you know, it's not going to pay, although in 16 I had one of my county committee persons tell me, well, they're, they're worth more dead than they are when I sell them, so. <clears throat> but 
but they're an average, it's a rolling Olympic value price that they use on it, uh, current market value. Um, excess of mortality is, uh, in 2016, we paid out $7,553 under this program, and we're just starting 16. So, and we do have some applications in on that. Um, normal mortality is 5% uh, for your calves and one and a half for uh, cows and bulls. Um, and a lot of whatever, what, what most of our people do that use this program is normally you are doing financial statements or renewals beginning of the year. You've got a balance sheet, you've got your taxes, your depreciation schedules, I just need a beginning inventory. Then if something dies, call me, text me, email me. We just keep a running tally. If it happens to be weather related, they'll say we called on the phone call. You know, it must have been that blizzard. I went out on the 8th of January, had two of them down in the corral. So we just, you don't have to come into the office to start the process. Just to remember to just, and like I said, a lot of my, my farmers, that they just text. Text the office, it comes right in. We've got a running record, a written proof. It works great. Email me, I've got cards over there with our email address. Um, to be eligible, again, you had to have owned them on the day they died. And they can, we can pay up to 60 days after the weather event. So say you're calving and it's wet and it's crappy like it was two years ago and those black calves never got dry. The sun never came out, they stayed wet, they stayed muddy. You treated them for pneumonia, you gave them six shots, you tried to dry them off. 30 days later, they're, they're dead. It's still a weather-related death because we know what it's like out there. So, I mean, they don't have to die in the middle of a blizzard to be eligible. You're talking baby calves? Yeah, we paid, yeah, that two years ago when that, we had all that rain and snow, we just lost a lot of them. Um, so, it, like I said, it, we can pay up to that. Uh, eligible loss condition, there's eligibility, that's the same thing. Um, next one, the loss conditions. Basically, it's wind, it's cold, it's hot, it's blizzard, it's winter storm, fire. Um, the disease, now we had paid, several years ago we had an anthrax outbreak and we did pay some on those and we paid a couple on the uh, cy cyanobacteria where they've got that algae and they got sick. So we did pay a couple on those when it got so hot and dry there for a while. Um, depends. The Atlas storm where the cows actually drowned by standing on dry land, they did pay that because it was weather related. Now, you're managing and you know you left a bunch of hay bales out there and you didn't go check on them for a week and the calves suffocated in the hay bale, eh, that's, that's going to be a little questionable. So, um, windshield, we have charts that they trigger. Um, a calf, if it's under 400 pounds, if it's a 10 degree wind chill, negative 10, that's an extreme cold for a calf. It has to be negative 30 for a cow. So there's variables there on how that, that goes. And we use several different websites. Um, one of them is SDSU. They have a, a monitoring site in Gettysburg for a weather station. It records the wind and the highs and the lows, and we use that. Um, I think Tolstoy has a National Weather Service up that direction, too. So we can kind of pick and choose where we need. So. Um, as far as extreme heat, now we've never paid any extreme heat. I know some did, especially those that they uh, were feedlotting that summer it got so hot. Um, basically it has to be the te temperature humidity index has to be 84 or higher for at least an hour. Basically that's 90 degrees with 65 percent humidity. So not unheard of in, in South Dakota. So. Um, um, nope, you would come in and let us know. Uh, like I said, a lot of our guys that use it just start the year with their beginning inventory because they know it runs a whole calendar year. They'll bring in their balance sheets, they'll bring in their tax returns, and I don't need to know the dollar amount, I just need number of head. And then if they do have a loss, like I said, a telephone call is all it takes to start the application. Does that cost anything? Nope. Nope. Nap. It's not like NAP. It's, there's no application fee at all. Um, and then there's the chart for the normal mortality. A um, little hard to read, but like I said, calves, 5%. Um, if you get a little older, from 400 pounds to 799 pounds, it's 2%. Adult cattle, 1.5%. Lambs, 10.7%. And for ewes, it's 4%. And having raised sheep, those 4% will be the ones that look completely healthy, standing next to the ones that look like they can't walk across the yard. 
snails will be the ones that drop dead. <laughs> um, applying for LIP, here you go. Just submit a notice of loss, call us, text, email, any of them count. Does not have to be a, uh, an office visit. Like I said, a good habit to get into report because once you, if you report them all, we already have your normal mortality accounted for. Now you can wait until the first weather event and, and bring us your books and we'll back it up from there. But like I said, it's, it's just as easy to start in January and work your way through. Um, if you run livestock in several counties, you you can start where you do your records, but the payment will actually come out of where the loss occurred. And we find that here where some of our producers run Dewey County land. Um, they've got some grazing over there. That might be drier. That might be a lightning strike over there. We'll start the paperwork for you, but the payment will actually come out of the Dewey County. Um, especially if they're, like if you're running shares. Uh, same I heard down in Corson County. I run those on two-thirds share. But my, my land I have got here, I run my, my whole herd. I don't have to count the beginning inventory of all of my livestock. Those share cattle down there are beginning inventory all on their own. They don't get mixed in with mine. They don't run the same grass as mine. So, so there's a different, little bit different there. And we don't have a whole lot of that, but there's some, some that happens. Um, and like I said, you don't have to visit that, that particular office, but the payments will come from that office. Documentation. That's a big thing, and what I can tell you is that each committee, each county committee may have different ideas as far as what they want for acceptable documentation. So this is just a very general overview. Like I said, most of the time, our guys will bring in a financial statement, tax returns. We've seen preg testing, <coughs> vet records, bangs testing, you know, receipts from the vet, anything that will work. Uh, during calving season, especially calving losses, you know, you've got your books, you use them, we don't judge on what's written in those books. <laughs> so, or how bad they look. But now I did, uh, my committee did have, they, we actually rejected one where someone turned in a typed piece of paper and said, this is what I lost during the week of that blizzard. And they said, we want your calving book. And he said, this is it. And they rejected it. So it's like, no, I, I want the real thing. <laughs> Anybody can type something on a piece of paper. So. So, but like I said, documentation, and it, there's a lot of different things you can use. Um, and I love this one. This is, this is typical government speaking. Furnishing the application is voluntary. However, I will not pay you unless you give me the information. So, so had a life about that. I like this one too. Um, the last thing I have is the, what we call ELAP, Emergency Assistance for Livestock. Again, we don't use this a lot, but we have. Um, we currently submitted $20,382 worth of loss payments for that hailstorm that happened just up the river here this summer. You know, it was just short, it wasn't very long. But the nice thing about this one is it covers by field level. So if your summer pasture, which is what happened up there, gets totaled out, I don't count your winter pasture that you're keeping over here for later against you. That was 100% loss on your summer pasture. It's going to get paid at 100%. Now there is a $20 million national cap each year, so it it's all goes into one pot. Doesn't get paid. I won't make payments until April of the following year. But it's nice to have. Um, we also used it the year they had that Lebanon fire. Went through, took a bunch of pastures out, took a bunch of haystacks out. We paid a little bit on that. So it basically covers what none of the other programs will cover. They threw it into here. Um, fire, we've got uh, transporting water. You do have to be a D3 on the drought monitor before that will kick in. So it's, it's a little bit harder to qualify for, but it's basically the same thing. You grazing during the, you own them, release them 60 calendar days, May 1st to October 31st. Um, the weird thing about this program is it does not run calendar year. It recovers, because it's nationally funded at a level uh, cap, I have to wait. It goes September or October 1 through September 30th. But our grazing season doesn't end until October 31st. So I may have two applications for the same pasture, one through September 30th and one for the month of October. It, and yes, it would be a lot easier if all of our programs run the same, but 
we don't have farmers that are writing these programs. Payment rates are based on what a corn would cost, and I don't know. It says in part on that. Now, I don't know where they get $1.79 on energy efficiency for one day, but that's how it is. Um, and again, the payment of the hauling water, you have to be D3. Applying the same thing, just call us, text us, email us. We'll get the process started. Um, it's a little hard to read on my handout here, and I do have cards over there, uh, but my email address is on the next slide. Um, texting, if you have any questions, I didn't cover. Um, it does say Mary Schmidt, and, yeah, and my real name is Mary Kay. Uh, but when I was two, my mother said I came out and said I didn't like that name, so I wasn't going to answer to it anymore. So for those of you who deal with me in the office and you find me a little stubborn, I've been practicing since I was a toddler. <laughs> Um, I have filled in a few more uh, websites just in case. I've done some hay net. There's some NRCS equip, uh, emergency haying and grazing. Like I said, I have every, everything up here as well. Um, the last, some of the CRP practices cannot be managed hay and graze. And we used to have to bale and destroy them, which was the dumbest thing I had ever heard of in my entire life. And Travis and you guys can say the same thing. But there is a donation program. If you would like to be on the list for donated hay through the state program, now they will prioritize if a, a certain county is in a drought or a disaster declaration, it will go there first, but they just keep a li list all year long of people who are willing to go and get the hay so it doesn't have to be destroyed. Um, the other thing I thought was nice on the very last slide, Josh, this Netscape, this is a picture of the land that Mr. Item rents from me, just right up here. This is 160 acres of spring wheat in 2016. This is a grass draw that runs through there. This happens to be a little triangle of wheat that they planted next to it, but you can go in on any place in South Dakota. It doesn't matter if it's your farm or not. This will have historical what's planted, what it looks like, the rotations. It's, it's a nice little program to have, uh, especially when crop leases turn over more often than they used to nowadays. Privacy Act, you can't always get information if you have the legal you'd at least have an idea of what was maybe planted there in previous years um, so I thought that was kind of fun um, also the ARC program for those of you who have crops please stop into the office your local office and sign up before you get into the field 